Thanks. Thank you very much, Erika. <laughs> okay, I have uh, 50 minutes. I will, in 50 minutes, finish my, my presentation. You know, as good Caribbean people, I speak very fluently, but I am aware that I have mistaken, particularly from phonetical point of view. Then, if during my speech, some of one wanted to precise something, please ask at me completely freely, okay? Oh. I think that, as the, the title of my lecture indicates, this is a moment of revisiting the cultural historical tradition. And as we discussed yesterday, is uh, we have to, to come to a conclusion of what we are talking about. Cultural historical, social historical, cultural historical activity. Uh, since, since 1995, there began to grow many uh, authors like Sinchenko, uh, Van der Beer, myself, um, or love, Russian, that criticized the identification between cultural, historical, and activity theory. Even because uh, it has a very interesting fact that Vygotsky was known all over the world be before he w was published in Russian. <laughs> then he became popular by American interpretations. Do you know, first call that have the great, the great merit to learn Russian, even because he spent one year there with Luria. But Luria uh, was a follower of Leontief and a subordinate of Leontief also. Uh, Luria and uh, Leontief were the heads of the group of Lomonosov uh, Faculty of Psychology. And during the 60s and the first part of the 70s, they had a very strong power in Soviet psychology. <coughs> but to, to talk about cultural historical psychology, from my point of view, implies to recognize that human psyche have cultural historical basis. And it was widely shared by many trends of Soviet psychology. I want to refer to two that for me are three are very important besides uh, Leon Tief, Luria, and um, Vygotsky was outside. Vygotsky was included in this Troika that really he shared with Luria and Leon Tief from 1924 uh, until the time in which his followers went to Harkov. That historically it is not well uh, explained yet to, uh, until to now. And the disciple of Vygotsky went to Kharkov, and Rubinstein, that it is very important historical fact, invited Vygotsky to replace Basov in the chair of psychology in the Herzen Institute in Leningrad. And it was precisely between 1932 and 1934 that Vygotsky had his last works. He will. Uh, he was very near, very close to Rubinstein. It is very important to say it because artificially, in the tradition of Leon Tief, Rubinstein has been excluded for the center of Soviet psychology. And uh, they are excluded also Ananiev and Miasishev, that the strong school of Leningrad that began with Bestarev, Lasursky, and Ananiev and Miasishev centered on the matter of communication. Uh, they were was the only group in Soviet psychology that focuses on communication and on institutional process. It's very interesting to read uh, these psychologists. And Rubinstein and, and his, uh, his group centered on consciousness all the time. But in the 40s, as I said yesterday, uh, Rubinstein was sanctioned and uh, uh, he lost all this church. He was the head of the Department of uh, Psychology in the Institute of Philosophy of the Academy of Science. He was the chief of the Department of Psychology in the University, in the Faculty of Philosophy of the University Lomonosov in Moscow. And he was replaced, and practically because was a conspiracy 
between, uh, essentially between Leontief and Galperin, that accusing him to be far from the ideological principles for uh, head the Department of Psychology. But all this trend configured an, an historical, cultural picture of psychology. You know, different uh, theoretical interpretations, different methodological approaches, but they were all inside a new kind of psychology founded by Soviet psychologists. I will center in my, as I want to center in what I am uh, doing at this moment about the subjectivity in the cultural historical approach, I will essentially uh, uh, took the last day, the last moment of Vygotsky war. But first, uh, before this, I want to read two very interesting uh, claims of Vygotsky in the psychology of art. Let me see first this. Listen, by its nature, artistic Perishivani remains incomprehensible and closer to the subject in its course and essence. Dr. Vygotsky, when he talked about Perishivani, he was not talking about experience as flow at the present moment. He was talking about a psychological formation that was unconscious for the people who engaged in one artistic performance. Also very important, and this is one of the goal of the entry, introduce the discussion about subjectivity, Vygotsky said also in the psychology of art, that from my point of view was his fair agenda, his foundational, foundational agenda was in this book that was overlooked for a long time in Western and in Russian psychology. He said, emotion and imagination are not two separated processes. On the contrary, there are the same process, the same process. We can rightly can regard a fantasy as the central expression of the emotional reaction. It is a very important claim for that time because integrating emotion with imagination and fantasy, he is implicitly integrated emotion with symbolical processes. Something that he did not advance in, 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 in the, during his career, but in, in this first war, he was conscious that the central for psychology was to enter in the emotional effort of the person, of the individuals. And emotion he never treated as isolated element, as an element that was external to the core of psychological functions. And also for finishing here, he said, at least until today, also in the psychology of art, this is my last paper about Pirishivani that will be published in Mind, Culture and Activity at the end of this year. At least until today, unfortunately, we have not generally recognized an elaborated system for the study of sentiments and fantasy. As you can see, the center of Vygotsky in that time was fantasy, emotion, human creativity, and he was looking how to represent all this complex process within an organic theory. But <laughs> by historical reasons, when he entered in the group of, in the group of Kornilov in 1924, when he shared the institutional space with Luria and Leontief, he gave a, a radical turn to a more objective psychology. Even I don't want to, to, to state, uh, but in the psychology of art are very important methodological contribution. But I will not state in this point. Uh, that instrumental period I will not enter. We can discuss during, uh, after my, my exposition. But in the last period, Vygotsky introduced two important concepts. He retook the concept of Pirishivani, 
uh, not in the same way that in the psychology of art, in the last moment of, of his work, he identified Pirishivani with the conceptualization, the conscious conceptualization of emotion by the child. This is clear in at the crisis of age seven. It's very clear. Then uh, it was strongly criticized by Bolshevik, that was the older trends of Soviet psychology that I wanted to mention. Bolshevik was with Leontiev in Kharkov, but after that he break, uh, uh, broke his uh, her relation with Leontiev and was the only Soviet psychologist that employed sense Pirishivani and such a situation of development in her works. These concepts were completely ignored during the Soviet period, completely. Uh, by one hand, by Leontief as his followers, but these concepts were in the opposite line of the Leontief works. And by the other hand, by the followers of Rubinstein, uh, Bruslinsky, Abulhanova, and Sinferova, and also by the followers of Leningrad School. Because, I say Peter before we began, the last Vygotsky was unknown for Soviet psychology. So, uh, Vygotsky was criticized by Rubinstein and by the followers of Rubinstein, and by Ananiev and by Lomov, by the period between 1927 and 1930. But after that, or before that, for example, the psychology of art was published in Russia by the first time in 1965, <laughs> 40 years after it was written. It's something incredible. And these are facts that we have to consider when he speaks about Soviet psychology. But these three concepts, sense, social situation of development, and Piri Shivani uh, were very promissory for advancing in a new representation of psychological system, human psychological system. Anyway, the definition of Piri Shivanian sense sometimes overlapped to each other. Uh, Vygotsky tried to avoid the social determinism that implies the concept of internalization through the concept of Perishivani, because Perishivani were a psychological production of the child on the basis of one personality, and Vygotsky always introduced this element and on the, of the, on the basis of understanding when the, the child feels, when the child's uh, emotion, the, the emotion of the child. However, uh, Pirishivani was defined in so many ways for Vygotsky, by Vygotsky that, in my opinion, is an historical term. We have to find new concepts in order to advance on the subjective and emotional side of human psyche. We cannot state in Pirishivani as the concept was defined by Vygotsky, that it is very uh, extended trend at this moment. People get Pirishivani and try to define Pirishivani by observation of the emotional reactions. That is not Pirishivani at all. That is emotional reaction. You know, a different concept. Emotion is not the same than Pirishivani. And precisely when Vygotsky tried to integrate fantasy, imagination, and emotion, he gave a very step uh, forward trying to represent new units of emotional life. But it was interrupted, and at the end of his life, in my opinion, he attempted to do this through the concept of Perishivani and th through the concept of sense. Uh, it's interesting be because Vygotsky devoted to the concept of sense three or four paragraphs in uh, Thinking and Speech, in the, in the last chapter, that was one of the last writing. Oh, oh. Okay, listen carefully what he said about sense. A word sense, because Vygotsky associated sense with war, 
a word sense. Sorry, with work or with word, 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 word. Yes, word, word. <laughs> the, a word sense is the aggregate of all psychological facts that arise in our consciousness as a result of the word. Very interesting, because he's thinking a unit, psychological unit of consciousness that is in movement in the language, in the relation with the other, you know? And then it is completely new way to approach to the matter of consciousness, not consciousness and so, something inner of human being, but consciousness and psychological organization that is in process during the, the speech during this speech. It is very important fact. But this was completely not perceived in the Soviet times. And even the first author that get the concept of sense and emphasized the importance of this concept was Alexei Alexeyevich, the son of Alexei Nikolaevich Leontiev. In 1922, he has some fantastic paper Echo Homo, and now I don't can continue. That was published in the, uh, uh, how to say that, newsletter of activity theory that was organized by Engelstrom in that time. Uh, newsletter of activity theory. I have that number, I quote a lot, a lot because was important reflection that he introduced and has his growth in that paper. Leontief and his follower, Leontief father, never understood clear the last concept of Vygotsky. And this is one of the reasons by which they omitted those concepts. Then uh, it is important to say that cultural historical psychology was mainly centered on how the social turn it into psychological. And this is the reason by which the concept of interiorization uh, in the middle of the, of the 20, 20s to the uh, 30 was very important, even for Vygotsky, that in that moment identified in very instrumental conception higher behaviors and higher psychological functions. He was not clear w w which was the difference, ontological <laughs> difference, between Psychological and behavior is psychological was the internalization of external operation. That uh, phrase that everyone liked to repeat, uh, any internal operation was first social, I, I rejected profoundly because then psychological is an epiphenomenon of social. But introducing the concept of same Ampiri Shivani, he changed this uh, point of view. Because if you listen it in relation to sense, sense are all the psychological elements that rise in consciousness uh, together with war. Then they change, they are not the same, because war never are the same in the course of the speech. And it was a very important moment in Vygotsky's work. And his work, is, it was my, uh, one important antecedent for me begin to, to think about my concept of subjective sense. But subjective sense is not the same of the world, as Vygotsky talk. Subjective sense are the unity of emotional symbolical process associated with any experience that we have in daily life. Eh? We <laughs> Subjective sense are a kind of a snapshot of a symbolical, emotional uh, flashes that are contradictory simultaneously in each moment of our life. And it is one way for integrating all the microcosmos of cultural life in one singular trajectory. Okay? Because we live in a symbolical reality, that is culture, and we have symbolical definition of race, of gender, of uh, beauty, of everything practically. But all this flow of symbolical definition get concretized in our dia dialogical relationship, you know? And then 
we have, we experience one relation, but at the same time, we, we feel and unfold into our imagination or thinking a process that it is a subjective one because not depend from the external. It is not depend for what happened external of me. I create, it's produced, and I create not consciously, you know, and it is the generative character of human psyche that I define in this level as subjectivity. For me, and when, please, when I speak about ontology, I am not talking about the general essence of the being. I am talking about one registration, theoretical registration, that is sensitive to be mm -hmm. studied by different methodological approaches, okay? The language of science, okay? Then, uh, it started from that point, Vygotsky recognized it in Pirishivanian sense that environment cannot be taken in its absolute attributes for its relevance to the child. It has environment, social environment, is defined through Pirishivani. But Vygotsky did not stand, and despite he wanted to advance on the emotional side of this process, he always finished in the cognitive reductionism, because Vygotsky recognized that at the end, Pirishivani depends on the level of generalization of the child. You know, it was very good criticized by Bolshevich. Bolshevich take these two concepts. Bolshevich omitted things. I don't know why. Don't take consciousness about the relevance of sense. But uh, she took Pirishivani and advanced the Vygotsky definition and precisely put Pirishivani and the relevant unit of personality. Because the subjective side of human psyche was developed in Soviet time through the concept of personality. You know, no one can in that, in that uh, so Soviet times to talk about subjectivity, because uh, to be idealistic have a great political connotation, and no one wanted to be accused of idealism. But nothing more far from idealism than subjectivity, <laughs> because subjectivity is the way that we human experience our world. And then it's the only way we can explain how the multiplicity, symbolical production, or society are present here at this minute in me when I am talking to you. Eh? I don't I don't aware that at this moment I feel as Cuban, I feel as male, a male of my age. I, I, I bring memory from my from my childhood that are flashing in this moment. And this is the reason by which the configurations of subjective sense is the motivation of human subjectivity. I completely refused the concept of motive and something separated that drive the behavior. No, motive is intrinsic to the function because my function is subjective configured at this moment. When I think, I think, I imagine, I feel, you know, and all these processes are close interrelated within my subjective configuration that is during the action at this moment. So configuration, it is not an entity, a mental entity separated from the action. We also configure our action at the present moment. Okay? Of course, we are also configuration that has a more historical ground. For example, the subjective configuration of personality. But personality, in my view, it is not something that acts as determination of behavior, no. Personality is one source of subjective sense in this moment of my relation. Because all of us, we have a different configuration of our father, of our mother, of love, of friendship, you know. But all, we all have a physical father but we are very differentiated father from subjective point of view. Our configuration of father is forming not only because the father 
directly say or, or add to us. No, it's all the consequence and unfolds of the father behavior is configured in mind in different symbolic emotional unities. And a subjectivity is ne never a memory, it's never a sound. It's something that emerges in the quality of my relation with the others. We live inside a network of social relations. We live inside a dialogical network, something that Soviet psychology was far of understanding. It began to be discussed in Soviet psychology in 1970s, when Lomov, one of the, of the students of Fananis, entered uh, in full in the discussion of communication as different from activity. And it was a long discussion, but was a very important moment of development of Soviet psychology. There was a, a congress uh, that, uh, of the unit Soviet, Soviet Society of Psychology in 1977 that the, the name of the, of the congress was the problem of activity in Soviet psychology. And activity was strongly criticized by many, many Soviet psychologists. Nieponishaya, uh, Bruchlinsky, and fin. I cannot uh, finish the list, but was very interesting con Congress that I had the opportunity to participate because in that moment I was a doctoral student in Soviet Union, in Moscow. Then, uh, when we speak about subjectivity, we are recognizing the intrinsic role of emotion in our symbolical productions. Sartre, a long time ago, recognized that human emotions are also symbolical process. And he was full of reason because emotion turned into symbolical, uh, this inseparable unit is that configured the subjective senses. But subjective senses are very chaotic, are simultaneously contradictory. Um, all of you should have the experience of we're talking with one person and suddenly feel proud and immediately to feel angry with the person. It's uh, uh, this kind of, of variability of emotion and of symbolical unfolds are very typical in our, uh, in our life. And it's very, very interesting that psychology try always to explain by rationality the human processes. I want to ask to everyone here, when you control your passion for another person, love is uh, the best example of which are the subjective process. You can say, oh, the, for example, the, the girls, the, the women, or, or, or we as males, oh, this lady is not the best for me, uh, it's, a, no, it's not a good person, but you feel you are not thinking, and you cannot reverse your feeling by any kind of reflexive consideration. And it happens with everything that we like, but we don't, don't perceive. And I think that the way to advance some subjectivity from cultural historical approach is opening a, an avenue for the kind of processes that never have been the center of cultural historical psychology. I, Jan Parker is here. Yeah. Oh, he's there. I, I yesterday say, Jan, why psychoanalysis have the monopoly of subjectivity? Mm -hmm. We have to enter in a new way to advance on the question of, of psychology. I even seen that Jean is more cultural, historical than psychoanalytic, but he has another opinion. Because why? Why? Because the, something important to discriminate psychoanalysis, in my view, after that with the discussion, psychoanalysis and cultural, historical psychology, is that motivation emerges as intrinsic, intrinsic part of psychological function. It is not outside. It is not a drive that exists more in the somatic organization and become representation for be considered inside the psychological apparatus. No, 
is intrinsic to our function. We are feeling in the times, practically in all the times, of course, they are formal process. For example, I, we have in learning, in education, a student that learn from memory. They have not any emotional engagement. But that is the problem. This kind of intellectual operation are not subjective configured. You know, there are formal, repetitive operation. And this is the reason by which, in my conception of subjectivity, I am okay in time? Okay. In my conception of subjectivity, I never consider subjectivity as internal structure. Never. Individual external. Subjectivity is equality of any kind of human phenomena, social and individual. And it's the reason by which I wrote about social and individual subjectivities. I, does, I don't, don't reduce subjectivity to individual. For example, each institution, each family is subjective, configured confi 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 also, and is caused by political discourse, gender discourses, dynamic of the neighborhood in which the family is inserted, the legacy of the, the, the antecedents of the family, and all these processes are part of the family functioning that it is not the sum of the psychology, of individual psychology of the member of the family. One of the big mistakes that in my opinion was the first systemic therapy was try to identify inside the family the process that explain why one person ill and all they feel bad, etc. It is impossible because family is inserted in more broad than social subjectivity. And at the same time, each of the members of the family carry on to the family social subjectivity elements are not contradiction. Social subjectivity is not external to individual one. Individual subjectivity configured by science and processes of social subjectivity. And at the same time, social subjectivity configured by elements of individual subjectivities. It is not so evident. But for example, when you live uh, the process in which one strong personality <coughs> has a, 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 have a leader of a process that change your world, from one day to another, you perceive how important is individual subjectivity. I can assure you, but it is of course can be discussed, that without Fidel Castro, Cuban revolution never had happened. He has a decisive role as person, his force, his uh, imagination, his uh, wish to, to change the world, and he created a new world. Okay. The, that work, after that, is very complicated. It's another discussion. But what I want to emphasize is that individual is not an epiphenomenon of social subjectivity, or of social structure, or of social system. We are actively engaged in the networks in which we live, and we transform, we modify each time or the processes that surrounded me. This implied one concept that has been very polemic, even from the philosoph philosophical point of view, because of the legacy of structuralism, that is the matter of the subject. Mm? The matter of the subject. In my conception, not all the persons are subjects. We live in a world that there are a lot of victims, you know? Victims, victims. 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 Oh, victims. 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 Yeah. It's, it's, it's colossal. <laughs> victims. <laughs> okay. Then uh, we have a process of massification in the capitalism, in the, in the current moment, but in the socialism also, all the structure of power try to massify the persons. And the subject is that individual or group, because as exists social and individual subjectivity, also exists individual and social subjects. Even I, I, I think that one of the important legacy of Marx was for the first time approach to the concept of social subject, was the working class 
in the, in the Mars time. It's very important, the social concept. It's a group that in some moment share some interests and values and transforms in actions eh, that eh, modified the, the world in which they, they live. It is important also to recognize the individual subject. And what is the difference that I established be between individual and agent? That agent has redefined a factive role on the course of one activity. The subject, the subject is more than this. The subject is the person who critically, reflexive, question the system of norms established in the social uh, institution, social uh, space, instancy in which he lives, and open new path of subjectivation. And this clear in science, how difficult is to open new path for thinking. We tried, for example, until this moment, we continue listening about Pirishivani, but Pirishivani was an incomplete, un incomplete concept and very bad accuracy concept, have a lot of contradictory approach to the matter of Pirishivani, but anyway, person insists to take Pirishivani to enjoy the shadow of Vygotsky's power in the legacy of cultural historical psychology. And I, I think that the question is to open new, new paths of thinking that uh, can create intelligibility in our research lines. And it is very important. And subjectivity is one option for, uh, for advance on topics that historical have been disconsidered. For example, in our uh, researches about the, the le learning failure, the learning troubles, we discover that many children, even that have the, the diagnosis with uh, hyperactivity and how to say the, the, this ADHD. syndrome? ADHD. ADHD. This lack, yes, the same. That they have a very turbulent family life, they are not integrated in the group of the neighborhood of them. They have problems with their own race in the schools because the matter of race in the school is very high, it's very complicated. There are many, many not emotional troubles and they don't have a social space in which they recognize inside the school. And of course, with this emotional situation, with this subjective position, it is impossible to learn. Because he afraid that the teacher will ask him some question. And he avoided the teaching question, is put here, put here, but it's, it's not follow what the, the teaching is talking. And the more important thing, at least in Brazil, and in Cuba also, is that this kind of child never has been interviewed by the professor in order to know how is his life, how he lives, how is the, which are his problem, how the professor can involve in the emotional situation of the child in the school. And subjectivity permit me to consider some elements that traditionally have not been considered for discussing this kind of phenomena. You know, I can also to stand in the problem of health and so on. But I want first puntualize or underline that subjective configuration it is not a reflection, it is a production. It is an, an expression of the, our subjective generative character. And sometimes is very far, and it is one of the important results of subjectivity, is very far from what happened objectively around us. Vygotsky has a very good uh, statement in his uh, uh, lesson on defectology that he said, the psychology personality of blend, it is not the result of blending, it is the device for overcome the barriers of the blend. You know, I don't, is it you? Blind. Uh, blind, no? Blind, blind. it's okay. Blind. Yes, blind. yes, blind, blind. blind. Don't see. see, the person that don't see. Mm. You know, it's the device yes. for overcoming the barriers 
that this sensual limitation create to desires. Mm -hmm. And there, in this point are the risk and the stronger point of subjectivity. We create options of life uh, that exist only in our imagination, but are very important for opening new avenues in the real, the real world. And uh, what is the real world? I am not clear, <laughs> uh, because we, we we live in very imaginary world. Okay, then these are my essential points. I still have time. If you want, yes. Then I can. I, I would like to to fulfill my 50 minutes, but these are my crucial key ideas for discussing with you today. In my experience, it is not very good to try. Uh, to give more information that the, the others can get in some moments. Then, this point, subjective sense, subjective configuration, subject, social and individual subjectivity, and what represents subjectivity as an heuristic alternative in this moment in cultural historical psychology are the points that I would like to discuss with you today. I only, from my scheme, I forgot to say that the last Vygotsky was very influenced by uh, the protection <laughs> of Rubinstein, but also was very influenced by poor Levin. Levin uh, influenced so much Vygotsky after uh, 2030s. You know, even the concept of social situation of development was pra practically implicit in Kurt Levin, because Levin said that the human need needs change the environment. It is not the environment that is responsible for human needs. And that, is, uh, that uh, exists a very tensional relation between human needs first and environment. But of course, after that, he advanced on topographical psychology that, in my, from my point of view, empowers the, the essential ideas. Then I, I, I invite Peter to make. Yes, that's wonderful. Come here, Thank Peter. Thank you. Very succinct. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure we will return to some of these key points. Thank you. The English was okay. Everyone understand. It's the moment to precise something that you don't understand. Mm -hmm. eh, Imagine in the right accent. It opens up the Okay, then. Peter, and after that we open the discussion, the dialogue with you. Oh, Peter, excuse me. Another point that I forgot. No, another point. Yesterday I listened here the relation between activity theory and Bakhtin. How is it possible to define this relation? If Bakhtin was completely omitted in Soviet psychology. There was not there was not a one quotation of Bakhtin until uh, 1977 that Lomov introduced Bakhtin in the discussion about the dialogue and communication. Then we have to be consequent or to create new paths, new avenues. But Bakhtin, I, I, left, I seen that Leontief had allergy of Bakhtin. <laughs> well, Bakhtin was very subversive for Leontief. Okay, Peter. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you to all of, of you. You have to be patient to follow my English. Patient and very accuracy, attention. But this is the life. Uh, the more important is to communicate. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So, Peter Jones, some of you heard his, his uh, um, contribution presentation yesterday. Um, so Peter's a linguist by background, uh, very engaged in the debates about uh, language and psychology and particularly the models of language that inhabit Soviet uh, psychology. Um, and uh, you work at uh, uh, Sheffield Hallam University uh, for quite a long time. <laughs> Quite a long time, thank you. We <laughs> <laughs> won't mention the exact number of years. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for inviting me, and um, thank you for giving me the, the privilege of uh, responding to uh, my esteemed colleague. Uh, that is quite some job 
to do. And uh, there's a lot, a lot in there that uh, one could comment on, I think. So it's, a, it's quite a difficult task. I will um, perhaps say a, a, a few things which may or may not be totally connected to what Fernando says, but perhaps um, a few points and then we'll, we'll, we'll leave it for discussion, I think. Um, I was very excited to, uh, to read your, your recent papers uh, because although I'd read Vygotsky's work on uh, Perizhivanya, <coughs> I hadn't quite realised the extent to which, uh, for you in particular, this implies uh, a very radical rethinking of Vygotsky's later work. And uh, I think that's something that uh, we need to, to come to terms with. I'm not sure from what you're saying whether this latest work, this last work of Vygotsky, represents the ruins of cultural historical <coughs> psychology. In other words, does, to what extent does it in effect nullify or at least subvert or undermine his entire psychological theory up to that point, I think there is a sense in which you are saying it does because the key concepts up to that point, key concepts of mediation, of internalization and so on, are certainly based on the kinds of objectivist principles which you are saying he was turning away from in those later years. So I think, I think there is some clearly some new and exciting work to be done in pursuing the implications of this notion of perigevania and sense uh, for re-evaluating Vygotsky's contribution. I, I look forward to seeing some more work on that. Um, for my own position, um, I would say that uh, things look perhaps a little bit more complicated to me because clearly the notion of sense is developed in some detail, although not systematically, in uh, thinking and speech. The last, uh, well, I think, posthumous yes, book. Yes. Um, and it is presented in a way in which one can clearly see continuities, theoretical and, and other continuities, between that concept and Vygotsky's earlier work. And therefore, I think there is a sense in which one needs to be able to contextualize all Vygotsky's intellectual development in relation to the project that he had in mind and in relation to also the starting points of his work um, in the earlier uh, period in the, uh, in the 1920s. Now, as I said yesterday, um, there's, there is perhaps no other psychological theory which appeals more to concepts of language, signs, communication, symbols uh, than Vygotsky's psychology. It's a, it's a psychology that is framed around particular conceptions of language and communication, if you like, or semiology. And the significance of that, therefore, is that we cannot properly evaluate or criticize Vygotsky's theory without looking very hard at all that semiological work in terms of trying to position Vygotsky within particular traditions of thinking about language and communication, in terms of his relationship to the developments in linguistics at that time, which were also very influenced by particular, very long-standing trends in the development of Western thinking about language and thought. Uh, and I think, to a, to a certain extent then, there's a lot of work to be done still in looking critically, examining critically, those ideas about language and communication, including sense, which are absolutely fundamental to the Vygotskyan psychological enterprise. And I think from that point of view, as I said yesterday, uh, there are certainly some, uh, some questions uh, to raise. In terms of his key, key theory 
key, the key theoretical contribution. Um, we've got obviously conceptions of sign, uh, conceptions of speech, we've got external speech, we've got egocentric speech, we've got inner speech or private speech. Uh, we've got the key notion of the command, which is what it took over from Janet, and which actually is the foundation of the genetic law of psychological development, the internalization law, which you described earlier. Um, we've got meaning, we've got sense. Um, we've also got approaches to writing and the relationship between writing and speech. We've got work on play and the symbolic uh, capacities of play on maths. We've got grammar teaching as well. We've got a whole series of very important positions that are put forward, uh, particularly latterly in, in, th in thinking and speech along these lines, which require very careful critical investigation as to the presuppositions that they contain about the nature of language and communication. Every conception of language or of a language has deep cultural and historical presuppositions and furthermore it connects to everything. So everything, as we know, intellectually everything connects. Psychology itself uh, connects to studies of language because psychology presupposes ideas about language. In turn, ideas about language presuppose psychological notions and they also presuppose sociological notions. So the whole thing connects in that way. So my own work, when I'm looking at the, when I'm concentrating on the, lang the linguistic, if you like, or semiological ideas of Vygotsky, it's one way, it's one way of approaching all these interconnections in his work, which are presupposed in the notions of language and communication that he employs in these works. And so, of course, if you radically changed your model of language, let's say, from what you find in Vygotsky, a Vygotsky in psychology becomes impossible. To take an example, if you, if, if you are fans of conversation analysis, for example, that kind of ethno-methodological tradition in discourse analysis, you couldn't possibly build a Vygotsky in psychology on conversation analysis, for example. It has quite different presuppositions about what counts as communication, about how people communicate, about the significance of communicative <coughs> conduct in context. You could not possibly build a, psycholog a psychological model like Vygotsky on that basis. And there are other quite radical new approaches in language and communication based around ideas of coordination or integration of activities and so on in which the community the communicative and linguistic capacities of people are exercised in and through those actual coordination of real-time activities by real flesh and blood, indiv blood individuals in real contexts those approaches to language and communication based on coordination and integration. Again, you could not build a Vygotsky in psychology on that basis. So in other words, we've got to look very carefully at this. It's not just, I think, a question of using more, more recent ideas, let's say, more, more recently developed theories of language and communication to look critically at Vygotsky's work and perhaps to try and modify it in some way in order to take account of these more recent ideas about language and communication but it's to see that fundamentally that psychological tradition wouldn't have been possible with these new ideas about language and communication. I think it's that serious that we've, we've, got, to, we've got to see historically of course how these things develop so I'm not in any way trying to detract from those traditions. But we've also got to see that, to a certain extent, Vygotsky's psychology was, of course, a creature of its time. And in, 
in its development, it incorporated particular types of theoretical presupposition about language and communication, which s certainly some kinds of radical theory would simply not enter entertain these days. And we've got to see, therefore, I think, to what extent this whole kind of psychological tradition was founded on particular types of ideas about language and communication that we simply wouldn't accept these days. Um, let, me, let me quote a, one thing, if I may, um, from the book that is called, I think it's called Ape, Primitive and Child. <laughs> I think this is a, this is a sort of a, a joint construction, I think, of Luria and, uh, and Vygotsky. Mm. And uh, it's, it's an interesting book in many ways. Um, but let me quote from that uh, one passage which, which is, I think, of, of interest to us in this context. They say, just as man's increasing domination of nature is founded less on the development of his natural organs than on the enhancement of his technology, so also his control over himself and the unrelenting development of his behavior is founded mainly on the enhancement of external symbols, devices and techniques elaborated in a particular social environment under the pressure of technical and economic demands. So here we see two things. One thing we perhaps over-concentrated on yesterday was the heavily early domin uh, influence of a kind of a mechanics mechanistic reflexological approach on Vygotsky's thinking. And here we see that in here on this emphasis of control, mm -hmm. regulation by social forces in effect. So that idea of uh, the regulation of behavior and the self, then the self-regulation of behavior, that notion of regulation actually comes from the behaviorist or reflex tradition. The idea of sociality as a way of regulating and controlling individuals to the point where they internalize that regulation and control and make it part of themselves. That is the that is the basis of the genetic law of psychological development, and it's the, the root of the notion of internalization. All that comes through the reflex tradition. But you'll notice that we've got something slightly different here. We've got this: the control now is being exercised by the by external symbols, devices, and techniques. So Vygotsky switches the emphasis here to those systems, if you like, linguistic, communicative, symbolic systems, which are going to provide the distinctive cultural, social and cultural framework in which that regulation of behavior is going to be possible. It's that layer of symbolic control that is the, is the focus then of Vygotsky's, uh, Vygotsky's work. I was looking at Psychology of Art last night because you mentioned it yesterday and, and in particular con in connection with the idea of Peri Givani. And what, what struck me about, about it um, I, I was reading Peter Magorinsky's uh, mm -hmm. article on it, was the extent to which Vygotsky's thinking was so heavily word-centered. It's a logocentric view. It's interesting, for example, that this, a book called The Psychology of Art is actually about Hamlet. Mm -hmm. It's about a literary work. There's no discussion in Vygotsky of any of visual art, of music, <coughs> of sculpture. It's, Vygotsky comes from a particular educated Russian tradition where the written word, and particular high culture written word, 
that represents in effect the highest achievements of human thinking and of human culture. And so when he's talking about control by external symbols and the role of these symbols in the development of the higher mental functions, he's always got in mind that literate high culture and the word, in particular the written word, as the highest sort of development of the higher mental functions. You can see that so clearly in uh, thinking and speech when you look at the chapters of the development of scientific concepts where of course it's all about learning to read and write, how literacy transforms and controls the spontaneous uh, capacities to speak, it's about learning grammar, it's, it's, all, it's all that kind of literate stuff, uh, very conventional school educational stuff about the three R's which comes, which comes through very strongly in that. The psychology of art as well, it's a condescension towards popular culture um, and it's, it's this putting on a pedestal this literate high culture of Western, of Western art I think that we get um, in that. There's a very good book by a guy called Thomas Seyfried. It's called The Word Made Self. And it's a, ve a very interesting study of the, the significance and the importance that the written word played in, in, in Russian traditions and in Russian high culture. And so we see that logocentric tradition, very, writ very large in Vygotsky. As you made clear yourself, the notion of sense <laughs> is itself a word-based psychological model. So there's no escaping in Vygotsky's psychology from the importance of the word, and in particular the written word, I think, and high culture as a formation, as the key formation of, the, of, of higher mental functions. So the notion of culture that we get from Vygotsky is very ethnocentric itself. It's a very specific way of, of seeing and evaluating cultural activities in terms of and in relation to the kind of highest achievements of literate uh, Western art, I think. Perhaps we'll make one more point, if I may. Is that OK? Um, I think if we, if we wanted perhaps to, to change the agenda a bit and to think through some of the implications of the newer theories about language and communication, let's say, in, in, the, in the context of, of thinking about where we might go, then, then we've got to get away from notions of, all notions of language and communication which reify communicative practices in some way. Certainly the Western language tradition is full of reification. Reification in effect <coughs> preempts all the, all the problems that we need to kind of examine critically because it places right at the center of, of, our, of our presuppositions an idea that there is something intersubjectively available called language. And that we can place this already intersubjective phenomenon or construct right into, the, right into the center of our work and we can assume that there is such a thing called language. Or we can assume that there are words. Maybe we've got to learn what words mean uh, or there, uh, maybe we've got to work, learn the sense of words, maybe we've got to change and develop word meanings, but words exist. There's never any sense in those traditions in which we can question critically <coughs> the idea that words are there to start with, or how they might be there, or where they come from. So I think we need to perhaps explore the advantages of seeing a looking at approaches in which we don't make those kind of presuppositions to start with. We don't reify aspects or constructs of, 
of uh, communication and language, or, or, or mentality for that matter. We get away from thinking about units, units of sense, or any, units of anything else, and start looking more concretely at actual communication between real, real individuals in context. That might be where, where, where the interest might lie. When we think about it that way, communication does not start from identities of individuals. It doesn't start from what is shared in terms of an identity of meaning, an identity of values, or anything like that. Communication starts from interpersonal difference, the fact that we are different individuals. Communications born of interpersonal difference, but it's born of the interdependence of these different self-acting people. Even babies are people. They're not bundles of natural psychological functions or response mechanisms waiting to be tamed by social, social symbols. They are people. They may be novice people, like, like we all are in a way. They may be novice people, but they're people. So communication is born of these interpersonal differences, but interdependencies of people at various stages of their apprenticeship at being human. So learning to communicate is not about adults taming child reactions or socializing them into particular forms of behavior. Uh, but as Senate put it, actually, in his interesting book uh, on cooperation, infant experiments with cooperation, that's how he talks about it. Okay, infant experiments with cooperation. So communicational practices, communicational acts, they're reciprocal acts. They're, they're ways in which these people, this person, relates to this, this other person or these people. It's not an intersubjective identity. It's complementaries. That's what sociality is. It's not a sameness. It's not some blanket shared value system. It's an interaction, it's an interrelation of complementaries. We're complementary to one another. And we have to find our own ways of being useful to one another or, or helping one another or be, becoming of value to other people in their lives. That's what the basis of communication is. It's always then that from the very beginning a process in which you put your whole being into it. There's never any sense then in, in which we can abstract from or decontextualize communication as something extra personal or as something that we can reify. We, 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 put our, we put our whole selves into it like I'm doing now. This, this is me. I, I, my whole being now is, is, is with you in my relationship with you. That's what communication is. It's how we learn then to fit with other people, how we learn to coordinate and integrate our activities with those, with those other people. All our psychological powers are developed in, in those interactions, in those ways of fitting with one another and fitting with the world. So from that point of view, I think, this is where we need to then re-look at all of the concepts and traditions of language and communication that we find in Vygotsky or in other psychological theories, and certainly in Leontiev as well. We have to see what the presuppositions are. We have to see where the reifications come from, because those re reifications tell us a lot about the, the accepted presuppositions and prejudices of particular cultures. And I think in, in, in doing that, I, I hope, in, in fact, in doing that, that we might comp complement or even contribute to this radically different way of approaching Vygotsky's work on the basis of what seems to be 
a quite radical turn towards the interper towards the personal, toward towards subjectivity, rather than towards processes of control and internalization. So thank you, I'll stop there.